I am Mark Akers, Director of the Institute for Child Development and Family Relations, and it is my distinct honor today to introduce our guest, long-term anti-racism activist, Ms. Jane Elliott. In response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, Jane Elliott, then an elementary school teacher, devised the Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes exercise. This now famous exercise labeled participants as inferior or superior based solely on the color of their eyes and exposed them to the experience of arbitrary discrimination. Since that time, Ms. Elliott has dedicated her life to anti-racism activism as an educator, a diversity consultant, as a speaker, her message has inspired millions. The ICDFR has been fortunate to host Ms. Elliott here at CSUSB to speak on campus and to our campus community and local communities several times over the last decade. Each time she has been here and spoken, the audience has been overwhelmingly moved by her passion, her brutal honesty and emotion, and her personal challenge to each of us to recognize, acknowledge, and confront racism. She is back today to share her message and to talk about her lifetime of anti-racism activism. Today's conversation with Ms. Elliott will be facilitated by Dr. Kelly Campbell, who is the Associate Director of the ICDFR. So as I turn the event over to Kelly, I will simply say, Ms. Elliott, welcome again to CSUSB. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your wisdom. Kelly, my thanks to you as well. Hey, thank you, Mark, and welcome everybody. And Ms. Elliott, so thrilled to have you with us. So we've had some questions submitted as people registered for the event, and we have lots to ask you. So I'm just gonna jump right into our first question. People would like to know from your perspective, how has racism changed over the past 50 years? Have things improved or gotten worse? It was getting better. And then Barack Obama was elected president. And I thought, now I can give up doing this because people are getting sensible. I didn't quite realize that once we got a black man in the White House, that 30% of the population of the United States who believe in the myth of three or four different races were angered and absolutely determined to see to it that that man would not be successful as a president of the United States and would not be reelected. Well, he was reelected. And then Mitch McConnell and company decided that they would do everything they could to get somebody in the White House who would not be in favor of anything, anything that Barack Obama did or proposed. And that there would, we would have our future president would be someone who was like that 30% of the population of the United States, a racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic, ethnocentric, boy grown tall. And that's what we have in the White House right now. And the reason he's there is because 30% of the population of the United States believes in the myth of more than one race. If, the, if you folks today don't get anything else out of this, you realize this, there's only one race of people on the face of the earth. And those are homo sapiens. We are all members of the same race. And you need to realize that we are all descendants of those first modern human beings who evolved in between 300,000, 500,000 years ago in sub-Saharan Africa. And you also need to realize that those brilliant people moved from the area of the equator, north, south, east, and west. And as they moved from that area and moved farther and farther north to populate every landmass on the face of the earth, their skin, their hair, and their eyes got lighter because they were exposed to less sunlight, so their bodies produce less melanin. That is the reason for skin color, people. <clears throat> it's not because we have mongoloid, caucasoid, and what's the other one? Whatever the other one we name. <laughs> Races. There's only one race. We are all homo sapiens. Now, every one of us has some of those other other races in us because those people united with people who, with, with other races. For instance, there are many people who are part Neanderthal. And you can always tell a Neanderthal because they're inclined to abdominal fat, they're bullish and brutish and bullying and have orange hair. Now, I think you can remember that you, the next time you see someone who looks like that, remember you're dealing with a Neanderthal and don't get too excited. Next question. <laughs> 
Okay, you you bring a very unique perspective because of your focus, but also you live longer than many people in the webinar. So we really value that 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 perspective. I have lived, I have <laughs> lived longer than most of the people on the face of the earth. I'm fully aware of that, but and I would like to go elsewhere, but I can't until we solve the problem of racism. We could solve the problem of racism with education. If we would educate people properly, if we would stop, for instance, if we would stop using words like white and black for skin color. This skin that you're looking at in me is not white. My shirt's white, my hair is white, my skin is not. Every person on the face of the earth is a shade of brown because we are all descendants of those first modern human beings who had a lot of melanin in their skin. But when you, when the, during the Spanish Inquisition, when they decided which people they could kill because they found out they'd killed a whole lot of Christians because you couldn't tell what a person's religion was by looking at them. So at that point they set upon skin color. And that's when they decided to call the top group, the people who they couldn't kill white and the people that they were allowed to kill black. Now, black and white are polar opposites. If a child grows up thinking that he's black, if he has read, if he's ever read a, a, a story, a nursery rhyme or a folk tale, he's find out, he's found out that white is the color of purity and goodness and black is the color of evil. How dare we continue to call people white and black when we know the difference? My dad would say to me, you know the difference between right and wrong? Now do the right thing, God damn it. It's time for us to change how we describe ourselves and other people and stop defining people as either white or black because no such person exists. I have seen lots and lots of so-called black people and most of them are black haired and their skin doesn't match their hair for the most part. I've only seen two people in the 86 years that I've been alive, whose skin matched their hair. They were truly black, but they came from the same ancestors that you and I did. So let's just get over it. And they recognized that they have to call me white, even though I'm not. To me, white is not a compliment. It's a misnomer and we ought to get over it. Okay? Completely agree. Language is powerful. Okay, here's our next question. Well, absolutely, somebody has said, Words are the most powerful weapon devised by humankind. And if you can use two words, white and black, to force people to think the way you want them to think for 500, over 500 years, those are powerful words. We need to get rid of them. Now, a whole lot of black young people are going to say, I don't want to give up my blackness. You don't have to give up your blackness. But you have to realize that your skin color is not your race. Your skin color is your skin color. There are hundreds and hundreds of skin colors in the human race, but that is not your race. You're not a member of the black race, you are a member of the human race. And you pale faces are not a member of the white race, you are a member of the white color group. You are not a member of the white race because there is no such thing. Now, I can say this and I don't have to worry about you responding and yelling at me because I can't hear it. If you've got something to yell, yell it into your cell phone later, okay? What's your next question? Okay. You have been a lifelong activist. What is your advice for people who share your concerns regarding racism and want to be an activist? Prepare to suffer. Prepare to lose your friends. Prepare to you lose your image as a calm, reasonable, quiet, accepting, go along to get along person. Prepare to have to fight to get your message out. On the other hand, prepare to know that you have attempted to make life better, not only for the present, but for the future. Realize that in within 30 years, what we call white people will be a numerical minority in the United States of America. Within 30 years, white people will be a numerical minority. Therefore, you need to realize that within 30 years, this country will, will be run by people of color. And you had best start treating them fairly now, you pale faces, because you are going to be on the receiving end if you aren't careful of what you have done today in the future. We need to get people of color and women ready to run this show. And they can. Believe me, they were until 10,000 years ago. And if you have read Naomi Wolf's book about that, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it tells you what when this whole business of sexism started or choosing only males for important jobs. Females can do those jobs too. Now, another thing you need to do, go to my website, jane at janeelliot.com, download the printed learning materials. The first is a set of typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't racist. Go through that list and check, it, check those 
put an X before those that that's those statements that represent your present beliefs and an O before those that represent your previously held beliefs, then turn to the next page, which is the clarifications of those statements, how they are heard by the person that you're saying them to. After you do that, go to the third page, which is a set of commitments to combat racism. 18 things that you can do in your own environment, in your own life as a hum one person to change your beliefs about racism and the behaviors of, of the, pe the people who have to be in your presence. Go through that. Check one. Check, check yes or no if you have done them or not, and then go back and circle one that you check no, put the date beside it, and do it for a month. If you do that and you finally go through all 18 of those, you will find out that you have changed your attitude, you'll have changed your behavior, you'll change the kind of people you want to be around and the kind of people who want to be around you. And you will also have changed the environment. And now you're thinking, well, racism is a societal problem. No, societies are made up of individuals. Racism is an individual problem. Every one of you can change the level of, in, of racism in your community, in your family, in your home, and in yourself by, by doing it in a determined way, by setting yourself up to do it. And if you, if you are a failure in the eyes of your friends, change friends quickly. Great tip. And okay. I love that oh, you have those oh, practical oh, oh, tips. Oh, okay. There's something else they have to do. You have to read the National Geographic magazine for April of 2018. Go to the library, insist that the college library get this magazine and have it on the shelf. You see these two girls here? Their father is black, their mother is white. Would you call them biracial? There's only one race of people on the face of the earth. These girls are not biracial. They have a black father and a white mother. That doesn't mean they're biracial. They are mosaic. A mosaic is an art form that is new, beautiful, unique, and made of many different elements. And that's what these girls are. That makes a whole lot more sense than biracial because they're both members of the same race, but their parents came from different color groups. They are a beautiful pair of people. Then after you look at that, then look at this page. Can you see this? Can everybody see this? I hope. This is a map that shows where modern human beings started and where they moved from to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Every landmass on the face of the earth was populated by those dark-skinned people that we call black and who weren't, without any modern technology to help them to do it. Think about the brilliance, the curiosity, the courage, the magnificence of those people. And then realize that the only reason like, there were lighter-skinned people up in here is because they were those black, so-called black people were exposed to less and less sunlight. So their bodies produce less and less melanin. That's the only reason the people in the Scandinavian countries are light skinned because they're exposed to less and less sunlight. People, your skin color is the result of your body's adaptation over the centuries to sunlight. It has nothing to do with being different races. Please remember that. And particularly remember that when I come back to California in December, <laughs> because I'm gonna get really angry if some student comes up to me and says, well, you know, Ms. Ellie, I know I'm, uh, don't do it. And I want you to read this book, everybody. Read the book on tyranny. It's what, a hundred and some pages, a hundred and 126 pages, 126 pages of pure brilliance. These are 20 lessons from the 20th century. You read this book. It'll take you half an hour. But if you read it and Think about it while you're doing it. You will never forget it. Everybody should have a copy of this. This is only $7.50. It'll be a whole lot best, less, I'm sure, if you get it on your Kindle. Get this book and carry it in your pocket instead of whatever else you've been carrying in your pocket, boys. Start carrying this because everybody needs to read this. No one can be harmed by this. Do you understand that? Nobody can be impregnated by this. This is something valuable that you can carry in your back pocket. And when you whip it out and show it to people, they'll think, Good Lord, that is a thinking human being. Whip it out and show it to people, but only after you have read it and underlined it. People, the answer to the problems of racism, sexism, and all those other isms is education. It isn't, it isn't teaching. It isn't counseling. It's education. I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead. The prefix e, which means out. The suffix ate, which means the act of. And the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. 
And that's what your college education ought to be doing for you, for, to you and with you. Kelly, I think that's what you're doing. I'm not sure everybody at that college is. But if they are, not if every one of those staff members haven't read this book, you students need to say to them tomorrow, have you read On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder? Every teacher and every one of them will say, well, I don't think you need to tell me how to learn, how to educate. And you need to say, if you haven't read Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny, you aren't ready to talk to me, sir or madam, because I think this is something we all need to read and we all need to relate to because it can change the way we live our lives. Getting right along, what was the question that I answered too, uh, too long? No, you did a good job. We, they wanted to know about being an activist and what's your advice for people who share your concerns regarding racism and want to be an activist? Self-educate, self-educate people. Read, if you don't read any, if you don't read that one and you don't read this one and you better read both of them. I was going through my books the other day and I found this. Beyond Racism by Whitney Young Jr., written in 1959, 1969. I'm not sure which I always get that confused. I'm hard with that. 1969. People, the year after I did the Blue Eyed Brown Eyed Exercise, Whitney Young wrote this book. I picked it up last week, found it on the shelf, and started to read it and realized, oh my God, he was talking in 1969 about the very things we're having to deal with today. So you want to know how far we've come? Not very far, because Whitney Young described in 1969 exactly what we have to do today to solve this problem. Does that bother you at all? Because it bothers me a lot. It means that we were making progress, and now we have taken, in four short years, gigantic steps backward. We've gone backward. What's 69 from 20? That's how many years we have gone backward. It's in four years, people. This tells you how gullible, how senseless, how willing to follow the Pied Piper into the crack in the wall. And that's exactly what a whole lot of us are doing right now. If we don't change, if we don't decide to vote and vote the right way in November, we are going to lose our democracy. You need to be aware of that. I think you aren't aware of how similar what is happening today is to what was happening from, 19, from 1933 till 1945 in Nazi Germany. I recognize it because I was alive at that time. Nobody can deny that to me because I know that it's happening. People, wake up, get out there, get active, be with the protesters because they are protesting what's happening in this country, not just to blacks, not just to LGBTQ plus plus people, not just to the aged, not just to those who have disabilities. They are protesting what's happening to all of us in the name of the person who wants to form an autoc autocracy. He doesn't like democracy because too many people are allowed to vote. He wants an autocracy, and this is not what this country was made, was, was to be, and it isn't what it, you want it to be, people. Democracy isn't perfect, but it's better than autocracy for everybody. Next question. Okay, it's related. So how do you balance the dangers of activism with the desire for change? For example, sometimes speaking out against racism comes with risks such as injury or even death. How do you decide to be an activist in spite of these risks? Nobody lives forever, and you can die quickly, at never having done anything. Dying or being killed because of what you're doing when you know it's right isn't as bad as living a useless life. You need to hear what Frederick Douglass said. Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them, and these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. And when you are living under a tyrant or a tyrannical government, if you don't protest, you will, you will get exactly what he wants you to get. Frederick Doug Douglass also said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of as many waters. He said, where justice is denied, as it is in this country, where poverty is enforced, as it is in this country, where ignorance prevails, 
as it does in this country, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. And they shouldn't be safe. Property for the top 1% should not be safe if the other 99% are living hand to mouth, which is what a whole lot of people in this country are doing. And if you think that that isn't happening, then you read Robert Rice's book, and now you're thinking, I don't want to do all that reading. Then you don't want to make change. You are happy with things as they are. You don't want to educate yourself. Don't blame me. Read Robert Rice's book, The System. And the subtitle is Who Rigged It? and how to fix it. If you haven't read this, people, it isn't very, it isn't a thick book, and it doesn't have huge words. It is common sense, written by a man who knew what he was talking about. You need to read this book, people. Self-educate. These are things, now you're thinking, I don't have time to read. If you have time to watch television, if you have time to go to Netflix, if you have time to go out and talk with the boys, or talk with the girls, if you have time to play golf, if you have time to play tennis, if you have time to go to the beach, if you have time for any of those, you have time to read. And it will stand you in better stead than all the other things I just mentioned. Okay? What was the question? It was about the dangers, you know, and, and you're saying live a principled life, live according to your principles. And, you know, it was just if you risk injury, if you risk death, you know, should you still be an activist in spite of these risks? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because Ruth Ginsburg was an activist. She will be remembered for a very long time. And she will be remembered because people are in better shape because she lived and because she was an activist. The rest of you can do that. You can't do it the way she did it. But every single person can make a difference. If you think and you're thinking, I know you're thinking right now, well, one person can't make a difference. How many people do you think Donald Trump is? Has he made a difference? He's made a difference in my life, and he's threatening to make a bigger difference in my life because he's going to take away Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, and Social Security. People, he has made a difference in your lives in taking care of those who didn't want to continue to, to protect the environment. He has made a tremendous difference. One person can make a difference, and so can you make it a positive difference. And if you die in the attempt, well, Mr. Trump would say, well, it is what it is. We've lost 200,000 people in this country in the last six months because of someone who says, when he hears about those deaths, it is what it is. It's going to go away like a miracle. It isn't going away, but 200,000 Americans have gone away. Be very careful about what you are willing to tolerate. Which one of those people? do you think deserve to die more than you do? Because that's, that's the thing. Who are, you going to, who are you going to choose to let go? People in nursing homes? People with pre-existing conditions? People who don't have enough sense to wear a mask? It's not a big effort to wear a mask. In fact, here's a mask that I think everyone should be wearing. You know what it says? Get over it. And I wear it because I'm talking about racism. Get over it. If you weren't born a racist, anything you created, you can destroy. We created racism and we could destroy it, but we won't destroy it by electing the kind of person that is in the, pres the president's residence today. Get over it, people. We can get over this whole situation. This COVID-19 is the worst thing that ever happened to us. Racism has killed more people than COVID-19 has. Millions more. You want to think about the first group we killed? Native, what we call Native Americans. We killed them by the hundreds. We weren't called a disease. We were called colonists. Colonists. And we were going to make the world a better place for those people to live. So we gave them reservations on some of the most uninhabitable land there is in this country. And we said we were doing right by them. Come on, people. You want to talk about reparations? Let's start with reparations to the Native American. Any other questions? Yes, we do. We have lots of questions. What do you say to the person who has truly lost hope about fighting racism in the U.S.? Nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. Just because that person has lost hope, that doesn't mean there's nothing to hope for. I believe in hope, and so did Martin Luther King Jr. For him, hope was, it is, for me, hope is 
an acronym for holding on to positive energy. And as long as you do that, we can make better things happen. I believe that we can turn this thing around. I know we can. If we could get into this kind of a mess in four years, we can turn it around by having a different person at the head of this, this whole situation. I have lots and lots of hope because, and the reason I have hope is because of all those young people of all different colors and ages and genders and gender of sexual orientations and religions protesting what's happening in this country today. That gives me tremendous hope because that says these kids aren't going to just sit back and let it happen. They're out there risking their lives, knowing that this fool in the president's residence is going to send troops against them. They're still out there because what they're doing is right. And I would advise every one of you to join them. We need to know to have the people who are ruling, running this situation, situation know that we aren't going to take it anymore. We're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. I know that came off a television show, but that's what we have to say. We're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. No members of the House of Representatives, no members of the Senate. If you're going to force us to allow you, allow you, to vote for an, another member of the Supreme Court who is unfortunately evangelical. And if you don't know about the evangelical movement, people, and I know some of you are, and you're going to really protest this, but before you protest it, get some of Frank Schaefer's books and read them. Frank Schaefer's father started the evangelical movement. His name was Franklin Schaefer. He started the evangelical movement in the UK. He taught it to his son. His son brought it to this country taught it to people in this country, and then he watched it be twisted and contorted out of shape. And he says today, stay away from the evangelical movement. It is nothing like what his father started or what he wanted to start in this country. People, you, and after you read, after you read Frank Schaefer's book, then get the book. I've got a copy of it here someplace. It doesn't matter. The Family by Jeff Charlotte and C Street by Jeff Charlotte. Read those two books, and you'll find out that in C at C Street, which is an address in Washington, D.C., members of the House of Representatives and the Senate can get cheap rooms if they agree to go along with or attend learning sessions run by evangelicals in the evenings. Now, think about that. If you dare, think about that. We are going, we are right now in a situation where in a country where we have separation of church and state, our members of Congress are being encouraged to be educated according to a rather interesting Christian religion in order to have cheap housing. This is scary. And if you think I'm lying about it, get Jeff Charlotte's book, The Family, and the other book, C Street, and read them. I don't think you're aware of what's going on here. I think most people have not read Jeff Charlotte's books, and I think most people have not read Frank Schaefer's books, but you need to get them. Don't worry about Sex, Mom, and God. That isn't one of his better works, but he has done several books that everyone ought to read just because I have no problem with evangelical Christ Christianity or any other religion as long as it is truly religious and not attempting to change the way all of us believe in order to, in order to make those people happy. This is what's going on right now is really strange in that evangelicals are supporting Donald Trump. Think about this. And the reason, one of the reasons, the main reasons they are supporting him is because he is opposed, he says, to abortion. What I do with my body is nobody else's business. If what I'm doing is a sin, that's between me and God, not between you and Jerry Falwell or, who, or his son and God. You understand that? And no man has the right to tell a woman what she can do with her body. There is a cure for abortion. And it's a very simple one. Anytime a male contributes to an unwanted pregnancy, he must also submit to involuntary vasectomy so that he won't contribute to any more unwanted pregnancies. Now think about that, people. How many of you young men when you're in the act of, maybe I'd like to do this, think, oops, if this turns out to be an unwanted pregnancy, I'm going to have to lose my ability to produce some sperm cells. Now, I think most of you would say, no, 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 no. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get a blanket. People, it's time for 
men and women to re be held responsible for unwanted pregnancies. I don't know a woman living today who got pregnant without the help of a male. But I know a whole lot of women who got pregnant with the help of a male and who were left with that child, having to bear that child, having to go through those labor pains and having to raise that child alone because that man oftentimes is off somewhere spreading his sperm cell elsewhere. Now, you're thinking, I don't like men. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, man, I like men. <laughs> oh, wow. my husband's been dead for seven years, and I don't even want to talk about this. However, you have to know, if we don't start teaching the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility, we'll never work our way out of this mess. Just te teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, and only one of those words begins with R, writing begins with a W, and arithmetic begins with A. If we don't start teaching the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility, we will keep on miseducating the American mind. We have to teach students that they have the, they have the right to be respected, and we are to be held responsible for refusing to respect the rights of others. Women have rights. Men are not going to be allowed to tell us what, how we can live in the future. And women shouldn't be allowed to tell men how they should live. But as human beings, we better start respecting one another's rights and being held responsible for it if we don't. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Somewhere and, in there yes. is the answer to your question. Okay. Yes, yes you did. Uh, we have a lot of educators with us today, and so they're asking, um, they would like to know your advice for addressing racism in the classroom, because you have a background as, as a teacher as well, an educator. Oh, the first thing, first thing you do the first day of school in the elementary grades is be sure that every child has a box of Crayola crayons. Don't have to be Crayola, but a box of crayons. Take out the white crayon. Everybody, take out your white crayon. Hold it against the back of your hand. Now, if your skin matches that crayon, raise your hand. Nobody will raise their hand because nobody has white skin. And at that point, you say, there it is, people. You see, there are no white people in this room. There are no white people on this earth, except in for those who are albinos and their bodies don't produce enough melanin to, to color their skin. There's a, if you want to know how that works, go to Google Tanzania and you'll see what happens to albinos in Tanzania, it will, it will make you absolutely terrified. However, in this Crayola crayon box, many of you will find a color that matches your skin. The white crayon doesn't match any of you. So then you introduce them to the Pantone color wheel. And on the Pantone color wheel, they will find color that matches the color of their skin. And in this magazine, and I have it here somewhere, is uh, several pages out of that this magazine that shows you the different colors of people's skin. What did I do with it? Now, this is, now, all right, go ahead. Say I'm badly organized. Ask me if I care. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do, because here it is right here. I'm not totally unorganized, just slightly unorganized. All right. These are pages out of that National Geographic magazine. See all these different colored people? Can you see this from where you're sitting? Can you see this? We can, yes. All right. Look at all these pictures, all these different colored people, people of different colors, folks. And under each one of them is the word Pantone and a number, because each of you has a skin color that you could find on the Pantone color wheel. Now, I'm not asking people to be known by their number. I'm asking you to realize that each of these is a human being. Each of these is a descendant of those first modern human beings. You will notice that there are no people of this color on these pages, because people don't come in this color, folks. There are no people of this color, even in Tanzania. You need to realize that every student and every student in that classroom needs to know that we are all shades of brown. There are no white children. There are no black children. We are all only shades of brown. Now, for all of our lives, we have known that white is the color of goodness and black is the color of evil. When you refer to a child at the age of five in the classroom as a black child, if he has had his parents read any of those, those stories to him, those folk tales, then he realizes that black is the color of evil. Why in the name of heaven are you going to allow that child in your classroom to think that that's the way he, that's the way he have to, has to act? Because after all, that's what color he is. 
Words have a tremendous amount of power. And if you don't think they do, then think about the fact that right now, black students are saying, I don't want to give up my color. As I said before, you don't have to give up your color, but you have to understand that every person on this earth is a member of your race. Every single one. And there is no black race and there is no white race. Those are color groups. There is only the human race. That's what these kids in school have to learn. And they have to be taught the three R's of reason, of rights, respect, and responsibility. And you do that by encouraging them to work for the good of the whole group. And you do that when I was doing student teaching. The, my critic teacher set up her room. She was a third grade instructor in Independence, Iowa. She was also the principal of the school. And she set up her room in rows. And the rows changed every week. And one, one student was the role leader every week. And those role leaders changed every week. And every day we would count, and she would count points. And if they had a clean desk, a sharpened pencil, and a hanky. And until you've been in a classroom with third graders in the fall, and they all have colds, and they're all doing that and picking their nose and rubbing their nose and rubbing on their clothes, you don't realize how important a hanky is. But she realized how important it was. So if there, everybody in the row had all those things, the row got to put up three points. And then every time you did something good in the room, you got to put up a point for your role. Every time you did something that was against the rules, if you didn't obey the listening schools, you, the listening rules, you had to take off a point. At the end of the row, at the end of the week, the row with the most points got into the grab bag. And the grab bag is a paper sack that has the kinds of things that little kids love: colored pencils, fancy erasers, that kind of thing. They kids, those kids worked their tails off to get into the grab bag. They were the best behaved students I've ever seen in my life until I got in, into teaching third grade. And my principals would say, I don't have to have a substitute for you while we're at this meeting in the multipurpose room. Your kids can take care of themselves because they could. They had learned rights, respect and responsibility. And they were working. Each role was working for those points. The teacher said, you're bribing those children. And I said, uh, do you get paid at the end of the month for the work you do? Well, yes, I work for that. Well, you see, the kids work for those points, and they deserve to be reinforced in positive behaviors. Well, I think what you're doing is wrong, and I say, and I think what the school board is doing is wrong in paying you, because you're standing here in the hall criticizing me, while my students are in there alone, and they're doing a good job of taking care of themselves, because they know the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility. And she won't moves away in a huff. Too bad. If you don't want to hear what I think is the truth, leave me alone. However, you can only carry that so far, I found out. Um, people are saying to me now, Jane, how does it feel to be socially isolated? Socially, what's that other word we're using? Distanced. I say, it's nothing new for me. I've been socially distanced for the last 52 years. I've been socially distanced ever since I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise the first time. Now, if you treat children like children that you want to get someday into their adult ego state, and you expect them to act, act as though they know about rights, respect, and responsibility, you will have no trouble in your classroom because what you are introducing them to is cooperative cooperation. They cooperate, I'm sorry, cooperative competition. They compete to get for that grab bag, bag but in order to compete for the grab bag, they have to cooperate with the peers in their role and they have to cooperate with everybody else. Because if you're unpleasant to another person in another role and you don't practice the listening skills, you take off a point. And the other kids in your role will not let you forget that because they work hard to get those points. And then you act like a fool and take one off. Oh, it makes them really cross. And I don't blame them a bit. I think they're absolutely right to expect everybody to cooperate in that competitive situation where they get the prizes if they behave properly. And if the one thing you absolutely must learn if you're going to be a teacher is the listening skills. Now, I know you all think you know how to listen, but you don't. Number one, write these down. And you write these on a chart and you put it up at the front of the room, no matter what grade level you teach, even at the college level. Number one, good listeners have quiet hands, feet, and mouths. That takes care of all the misbehavior in your classroom immediately. And if the kids start not practicing that listening skill, they have to take off a point. I guess you know that they'll practice that listening skill. Number two, good listeners learn, listen from the beginning to the very end. Wait a minute, wait, good, no, number two is good listeners keep their eyes on the person who is speaking. Good listeners keep their eyes on the person who is speaking. That 
keeps you, that means that you don't have to play any of these winky pool games. You think your kids are, and the kids aren't looking out the window because they're keeping their eyes on the person who's speaking, even if it's another student. The third one is good listeners listen from the beginning to the very end. That takes away all those little girls who are constantly raising their hand to ask a question. They don't want to ask a question. They want attention. So they're doing this. And you're thinking, uh, and you say to them, do you, are you practicing the listening skills now? Well, I have, are you practicing the listening skills now? Are you practicing the listening skills now? And they put their hand down. And in the film that you can see on television, this girl finally throws a fit and leaves the room because she isn't being listened to. She needs to know how it feels to not be listened to. And that's what she learns in that film, Made Her Furious. The fourth one is, and this is the most important one of these four listening skills, good listeners decide to learn something. If kids have decided to learn something, they will. If they have decided not to learn something, there's not a, that a thing that you can do about that. But you can say to that kid who has obviously decided not to learn, you've decided not to learn, haven't you? Go ahead and take off a point. And then everybody in the row is glaring at him or her. And all of a sudden it's, oh, it's not up to the teacher to control these kids. It's not up to the educator to control these kids' behavior. It's up to the educator to furnish the materials for the day, to furnish the, the, what they're going to learn for that day. It's up to the students to control their own behavior. Now you're going to have other teachers who will say to you, you are too strict. You aren't allowing those children any freedom. And you're going to say, wait a minute. They are free to practice the listening skills. They are free to earn points. They are free to get the advantage of having earned those points and getting a prize at the end of the week. They are not free to disturb the learning environment for the rest of the students. If they do, they will take off points. And it's not because they're upsetting me, it's because they are disturbing the learning environment for the whole class. They are not allowed to do that. Now, if you think that is too authoritarian, you need to remember, in that classroom, you, the educator, are the authority figure. And you'd better be able and prepared to be the authority figure. You don't have to be authoritarian, but you have to be authoritative. You have to know what you're talking about. You have to know classroom control. You have to show your children that you can control yourself and you expect them to control themselves. It is not your job to control those students. It is your job to teach them self-control to teach them rights, respect, and responsibility, and hold them responsible for their unpleasant behaviors. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, this is great advice for us, too, as college educators, and even for people in a couple relationship who might need their partner. Ab absolutely. When you have college students who come in with a can of pop and chewing gum, you need to say, uh, wait a minute. Good listeners have quiet hands, feet, and mouths. Mm -hmm. Good listeners keep their eyes on the person who's speaking. Good listeners listen from the beginning to the very end. Good listeners decide to learn something. Now, if you want to eat, drink, and be merry, stay outside. We're not going to eat and drink in this classroom. If you have a dietary problem that you have to eat and drink, then you need to send me a note about that, and we'll make an exception in your class, in your case. But when you're in this classroom, you are not in here to eat and drink. That There's a place out in the hall or down the, down the hallways, there is a lunchroom. You go down there and do your eating and drinking. And if you ladies are going to pop your gum in this room, you need to know that number one, it's tacky. Number two, it's noisy. Number three, it's violating the first listening skill. Now you're thinking, oh, she's too, uh, she's too rigid. That's not rigidity. That is educating students in how to learn quickly. My students learn twice as much in half the time because they practice the listening skills. Dr. James Doherty of Drake University said 60% of what we learn comes to us through our ears. 60% of what we learn comes to us through our ears. If we would teach children the listening skills and then as instructors have something for them to listen to that is going to be productive, we can change the the attitude and the behavior and the environment in every classroom in the United States of America. And we can change it into a place where people go to learn because they know how to listen and they know how to behave in a classroom environment. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, in looking back at your life of activism thus far, is there anything you wish you would have done differently? 
I wish I had known how racist the teachers and the men in that community were. And I didn't know. If I had known that, I would have warned my children, our four children went to school in that system. I would have warned them about what I was going to do. And I would have said, I'm going to do this knowing that you kids are going to take a lot of crap because I'm doing it. And when that happens, as it invariably will, you come to me. And if it's a teacher that's doing it, I'll go to the principal. And if a student is doing it, I'll go to the teacher. And if the teacher doesn't do something about it, then I'll go to the principal. And if the principal doesn't do something about it, I'll go to the superintendent. I didn't do that because I didn't realize the level of racism in those teachers or the level of jealousy. And I think most of them were just jealous because as they said, she's getting more attention. I didn't need the attention. That isn't what I did that exercise for. I got the attention because so many people who heard about it nationwide were impressed because it looked like it could make a difference. And it did make a difference. It made a difference in those kids and what they were as they grew up. You need to realize that those psychologists who will say, that's too rough on those children, that is going, that's traumatic. When you put those children through that exercise for a day, damn it all to hell, teachers put black children through this exercise for a lifetime. We start prenatally and we don't start after you're dead because there are still cemeteries in the United States of America where black people are not allowed to be buried. But psychologists don't think about what happens every day to people of color because they, like many of them, are like our bonded president who says, it is what it is. It doesn't have to be that way. Teachers who see that exercise on film and say, oh, that is too tough, need to realize that those kids are responding to that situation as little white children the way black children don't dare respond to that situation. Because if they did, we would come down on them like a duck on a June bug. And we do. And we kill them. We kill a little, what, 10-year-old boy walking across the playground with what looks like a toy gun in his hand, and the police shot him. And that wasn't the first one. You see, the remarkable thing about this last three months is, for the first time, when that young woman was standing there filming that white male with his white policeman with his knee on that black man's neck, even though people were say to, saying to him, let him up, let him up. He can't breathe, let him up. He kept right on doing it and looked directly into the camera while he was doing it. That was the first time I think that white people got a chance to see what people of color have been living with in this country for over 250 years. They have known it was going on. White black mothers have known when they send their sons out in the morning that they might not come home in the afternoon. And if they do come home, they might be beaten all to hell. They know that. And they have said it. And we have said, you're exaggerating. You're playing the race card. It isn't that bad. Or some teacher will stand up at the first of the year in a class of diverse students and say to them, I see people, I don't see people as black or brown or red or yellow. I just see people as people. That's the time when she ought to lose her job because that's a racist statement. She never puts white in there because it's all right to see white because that's the normal pay, that's the normal college, color. This fall, when some teacher says that, some student ought to stand up and say, you forgot to say white. Are you telling me that you, you see white, but you don't see people of color? She's going to kick that kid out of the classroom, and they're probably going to kick him out of school for being out of his place. Students, you need to be out of your place. When teachers say things like that, you need to let them know they're flat out wrong and that's a flat out racist statement. And when somebody walks up to you as they do to me all the time, white women constantly come up to me and say, I'm colorblind, I don't see color. And I'm supposed to say, oh, that's wonderful. You're such a lovely liberal non-racist person. Instead I say, I knew it before you said that because if you saw color, you wouldn't wear that shirt with those pants. And then they get angry. And they tear away from me faster than they came up. Hopefully, they'll never say that again. I'll never forget the teacher, the instructor in Texas, who stood up in a group of probably five or six hundred students and students and instructors and said, while I was talking, Miss Elliott, yeah, I just looked for the person's heart. And I said, if you can see my heart from where you're standing, 
you should go down to the local hospital and volunteer to be their x-ray machine. You can save them a lot of money. She said, you don't understand what I'm saying. I said, I understand exactly what you're saying. In order for you to relate to a person whose skin color is different from yours, you have to pretend that you don't see it. You look straight to their heart, which you cannot see. Furthermore, your skin is the largest inch by inch organ on your body. Make no mistake about this. And if you can say to a person, I don't see your color, you're saying, I don't see your skin. Who the hell do you think you're kidding here? She stormed out of that room. She was absolutely furious. And the black kids were cheering. And I thought, hasn't anybody thought to say that to her before? I'll bet she doesn't make that statement anymore. White women, watch your mouths. And don't talk to me about unconscious and conscious bias. Because the people who are on the receiving end of it realize it's bias. And if you have a bias, you need to lose your bias instead of giving, giving it another name. And that's what we do. We call racism a social construct. What it is, is a damn lie. But if we call it a social construct, then it's more acceptable. No, it isn't. A lie is a lie. And the idea of several different races is a flat out lie. Doesn't matter who constructed it, but unfortunately, lighter skinned people constructed it. And lighter skinned people, who are all members of the same race, could destroy it if they chose to. But you see, we choose not to destroy racism in this country because it's a money-making project. We make a lot of money off the backs of people of color. We have reinstituted slavery in the United States of America with our prison industrial system. And if you don't believe that, you read the book, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Read that this week and realize what's happening in this country, partially with the help of Bill Clinton's Three Stripes You're Out. There are thousands of young black males in prison today because of Bill Clinton's three strikes and you're out. And yet, a couple of months ago, we put let out of prison three white males who were cohorts of Donald Trump. And we let them out because they're on house arrest now and one is freed for good. We let them out because they might be exposed to COVID-19 in the penitentiary. How many of those young black males are being exposed to COVID-19 in the penitentiary. Well, it is what it is. Think about what it is we're doing and think about who it is that's leading us down this ugly lane and go to the polls in, on November 3rd in massive numbers and vote for someone who will put a stop to this nonsense. Your democracy depends on it, people. Make no mistake about this. This could be the end of democracy if you do not vote and vote the right way. Now. I'm neither Republican nor Democrat, but neither am I a fool. And I recognize what's happening now. You may not, but let me tell you, it is the beginning of the end of democracy in this country. Are there any other questions? Well, we're nearing our time. We have endless questions, but we'll, we'll thank you for your message today because you've covered so many topics and provided a very valuable message for us. So, so we'll end it there, Ms. Elliott. And so with that, um, I do want to thank you for being here on behalf of the Institute for Child Development and Family Relations and also our student society, SciKai, the International Honor Society for Psychology. Um, you've really impacted the lives of so many people and you've brought an awareness to the topic of racism that would otherwise not be possible and you're an inspiration to us all. So thank you for spending this time with us and for sharing this message and I hope to see you in person sooner than later, as soon as this COVID's over. And thanks to all our participants as well for being here. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. You're most welcome. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me.